welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. sociology of the transmission of um, cultural practices and forms of knowledge across the Atlantic and then in the Americas, you know, uh, you know basically from Africa to, uh, to Cuba. Although I think that uh, in already in that book I was you know, very uh, strongly disinclined to uh, view anything uh, that I was seeing in Cuba, uh, in Miami in, in this case, as, uh, as a remnant of anything. And, uh, one of the anecdotes which I start out with in this book is um, uh, one of those horribly, uh, you know, never-ending traffic jams uh, on uh, I think Route uh, 836, leading from the airport towards Miami Beach, where I was stuck with uh, um, somebody who became uh, a good friend over uh, the past, you know, almost 30 years now. Uh, a man named Ernesto Pichardo, who uh, some of you may know, won the 1993 Supreme Court case legalizing animal sacrifice um, for practitioners of his uh, church of the Queen Baba Nui. So anyway, so here we are, you know, stuck in horrible traffic, uh, 95 degrees heat. Um, uh, Ernesto was uh, at that point driving a red Corvette um, <laughs> um, with broken down AC and uh, the windows, the, you know, power windows didn't work either. So he was sitting there just drenched in sweat and, you know, I said to him, Ernesto, why do you have to drive this fucking car? He <laughs> says to me, uh, well, but don't you understand? A good diviner, and he is, uh, you know, uh, an Oriadea, the, the, you know, the Kaurishal diviner. He said, 
come to understand, a good diviner has to drive a good car. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, as I, you know, then, you know, went on to uh, write my second book called Wizards and Scientists, Explorations in Afro-Cuban uh, Modernity and Tradition, and, you know, the, the, you know, the framing was delivered at Duke University Press, actually got back to me and said, writing, oh, surely you mean tradition and modernity. And I said, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is that what we today understand as, you know, Afro-Cuban, or you could generalize that you know, perhaps uh, even further in the Atlantic world, uh, what we understand as uh, traditions are uh, actually coextensive and uh, have the same kind of origin as what we today understand as Western rational modernity. Uh, both emerge out of, you know, uh, violent uh, processes of modernization, which I think the argument can be made, uh, Eric Williams and Celar James made it long ago, that actually commenced in uh, the Caribbean region, uh, particularly in the agro-industrial complexes uh, known as, uh, slave labor-driven agro-industrial complexes known as sugar plantations, uh, emerged there way earlier than in uh, the metropole itself. Uh, you would be hard-pressed to find anything, uh, let's say around uh, 1670, you would find you very hard pressed to find a kind of <clears throat> proto-industrial, uh, certainly heavily capitalized, high-tech uh, work site employing more than 200 workers at a time. You know, this in Europe was still unthinkable, but it was it had been happening in uh, the Caribbean since the 1560s, perhaps. So. Out of this, are you see large chains, uh, uh, or in this context, what uh, enslaved Africans and their descendants underwent was a violent process of modernization, not just in that kind of you know political, economic, and uh, technological sense, but also in the sense of being completely individualized. That is, uh, being uh, separated from uh, you know all that have constituted their past all that have constituted their prior social lives, and all that, uh, you know, what we would call culture that people normally take for granted when they, when they you know, live in it, so to speak, and practice it. So, um, so, you know, I was arguing in that, in, in, in Wizards and Scientists, that, uh, you know, this, I mean, what we call afro cuban religion is actually, uh, a product uh, of modernity, just as much as uh, you know, thermodynamics, or uh, you know, or you know, supposedly uh, you know, um, and, and indeed uh, as modern as you know, if you look towards, for example, Horkheimer and Adorno's uh, dialectics of enlightenment, as modern really as the kind of uh, identity, as they put it, of domination and reason. So it's a kind of a, you know sort of perhaps contrapuntal relationship. Uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to uh, insist on that. Perhaps it's also it's also a dialectic of sorts. But uh, but these things keep evolving in tandem, and uh, not only because um, you know uh, I you know sort of want to see Afro Cuban tradition as something very modern, but also because you know whoever practices Afro Cuban tradition, so to speak, has never had a chance to do it, uh, you know, without having to confront, uh, you know, sort of persecutorial regimes uh, that varied in terms of, you know, their justification for why this had to be eradicated, but, uh, but that, you know, of course, uh, you know, they always were uh, sort of um, conducted with the mirage of, you know, uh, kind of a civilizing project, a kind of modernization project, whether in the capitalist or in the uh, socialist sense, as, as in Cuba, where um, it took the revolutionary government uh, um, on about 30 years, 40 years almost, uh, before uh, they conceded that their uh, project of, you know, folklorization of these traditions as kind of a legacy of a you know, capitalist past that had been overcome in a classless and raceless society, 
you know, we're just simply not melting away under the sun of socialism, but we're you know, sort of, uh, flourishing uh, in its shadow, so to speak. But uh, but anyway, so that's um, that's yet another aspect, uh, you know. And then uh, finally, you know, a few years ago. Um, I thought about, uh, you know, the Wizards and Scientists book is in many ways, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, if, um, um, obviously I uh, can't imagine that you've read it, but uh, it's in many ways a very tragic and serious book. And uh, then I thought, well, you know, I'm also in that book as a kind of, a, a, as a persona, so to speak, but, uh, but in a different way uh, than I wanted to write myself into this book, maybe in a very ironic style. And, uh, what this kind of is, is, a, uh, is an attempt to, uh, or what the current book started out was an attempt to kind of clarify to myself what exactly I had actually been doing for the past 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> and it took its origins in, uh, uh, in, a, in you know, I was the president of the Society for the Anthropology of Religion between, oh, 2007 and 2009, I think, and uh, you know, you always have to sort of, like, towards the end of it, you have to give a presidential lecture, and uh, you know, I called it um, uh, BL 2532S3, uh, how not to study Afro in quotation marks, Cuban in quotation marks, and religion in quotation marks. And then I added, you know, it was held in a conference facility. Uh, in uh, Northern California, Asilomar near, the, near Monterey. And there were signs all over the place, you know, what to do if you encounter a mountain lion. They, uh, you know, <laughs> scare it down, you know. That's part of the, you know, that recommendation. So uh, you know, I gave that lecture the subtitle, you know, it's gone from the book now, but I gave it the subtitle, uh, um, A Casual Attempt at Staring Down Mountain Lions. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the mountain lions that I was sort of confronted uh, with, or, or you know, I call, in the book I call them dragons, that um, uh, you know basically uh, have the function of shielding certain things from us by looking very fierce and very difficult to overcome. And uh, you know what uh, those dragons are. One of them, for example, is the symbol. Uh, um, notion that uh, all of these are pre-modern remnants in the modern society, social context. You know, sort of, that's something that's uh, you know, taken for granted. Uh, you know, so with all the kind of, you know, especially in my discipline, uh, background of studying Africanity in, outside of the continent as something that has been left over, that has survived, that is a remnant, or, you know, it, I mean, uh, I think uh, in setting up, uh, however well-intentioned my uh, intellectual precursors, particularly, of course, Melvin Herskovitz, uh, who uh, um, one of, I guess, I should say, your colleagues, a historian of religion named, uh, named uh, Dick Dorman, called the white whale of the black Atlantic, uh, has uh, you know, set up a kind, kind of an agenda where it, uh, it's ultimately uh, anthropologists who have to authenticate what is or isn't African about you know, things that people uh, practice outside the continent. I mean, you could actually also, you know, uh, and I have done that in the, um, in the introduction to a, uh, um, a collection of essays called uh, Africa's of the Americas. You know, I mean, you can actually extend that to Africa as well and say, you know, what exactly is it that uh, you know, makes things on the continent African. I mean, to just give you one of my favorite examples, what, for example, uh, is going on when um, you know, Episcopalians uh, <clears throat> distraught over the ordination of, uh, of gay uh, priests break away from the Anglican congregation and uh, become uh, affiliated with uh, an African province that uh, you know has a suitably hom homophobic agenda. You know, so like Nigeria, Uganda. I mean, there's there's lots of you know uh, congregations in places like Virginia or elsewhere who practice uh, a form of uh, Anglicanism that is uh, African directed and African derived. 
So are these people then practicing an African religion? I think it's a very interesting question. So, uh, <clears throat> so here we go with the Afro. In my case, of course, uh, you know, documentably, um, David Brown has, you know, sort of uh, researched that, uh, you know, very meticulously. Um, since the early, earliest years of the 20th, uh, 20th century, um, uh, or, or let, let me start all over again. I mean, the cult of Ifa, if you're familiar with that, you know, so, uh, you know, so ultimately a Yoruba-derived uh, divination system um, that um, emerged in Cuba probably uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, Cuba imported uh, slaves until very late and actually started importing slaves very late, namely in the 1790s. Uh, prior to that, slavery was <coughs> a fairly marginal institution until uh, Spain finally threw Cuba open to uh, you know, sort of free trade and thereby sort of you know, got its sugar industry to, uh, to take off uh, in a, a vertiginous manner. And so, you know, large scale slave imports <coughs> from Africa coincided with, uh, you know, uh, almost a century of warfare uh, between different uh, Yoruba speaking groups in the, uh, in the Bight of Benin, what today uh, is Nigeria, of course. So, if you look at a large number of Yoruba speakers in, or, or speakers of, you know, related uh, languages that we nowadays understand as Yoruba, come together in, uh, in you know, in largely mainly Western Cuba, actually, and uh, also uh, particularly urban settings like Havana. And by the late 19th century, uh, you get uh, a surprisingly small number of people, namely five elderly Africans, who caught, get together in uh, the town of Regla, which is sort of a kind of an industrial municipality on the eastern side of the Bay of Havana, which is actually also where I do my field work. And they get together to codify the mechanism whereby um, you know, the priesthood of Ifa, and uh, thereby, of course, uh, you know, the entire uh, cosmology and the spirit, you know, spirit world that, you know, comes with it, gets reproduced and transmitted over time. And what they do is they uh, set up a mechanism whereby it's the gods themselves who actually choose who needs to be initiated. And they do so, for example, by, you know, uh, visiting you with... Uh, you know, illness or terrible accidents or other misfortunes, and then you go to a divine and they'll tell you what you have to be initiated. Well, what that leads to is that uh, already, now, now I'm back where I started from, uh, already by the, in, the, in the early years of the 20th century, you get the first white priest of uh, this particular oracle. And uh, it's a man who, uh, of, you know, of Spanish origin, a uh, bodeguero, in whose back room, uh, you know, these elderly Africans have, you know, been doing their business. <coughs> and so he actually nowadays uh, constitutes one of the five, the, the founder of one of the five major initiatory lines in Ifa, worldwide, you know. And, uh, you know, even earlier, I mean, I worked on, uh, you know, I've worked on several, um, Afro-Cuban traditions, there are about four of them, uh, and maybe one a new one that's actually emerging uh, you know, it's right in front of our eyes these days. But, uh, but in the case of a male esoteric uh, sodality um, known as Abakwa, we can actually document uh, that um, the branch, which is nowadays regarded as the most you know, phenotypically black one, and possibly uh, you know, in terms of its you know, prestige, the most African one, actually uh, descends from a group of 13 white people who were initiated into that society in 1857. So this is, you know, very, very early on. So, so here we get a kind of a, a problem right away with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I mean, a necessary question about what is African or what is Cuban about this. But, uh, I mean, we uh, also get a problem uh, because, uh, you know, Given you know the uh, you know twentieth century history of that island, uh, after nineteen fifty nine, uh, the massive exodus of uh, you know from revolutionary Cuba spread these forms of ritual practice uh, across the globe, not just the Americas, but practically everywhere. I mean, there are uh, you know sort of uh, Europe is 
full of uh, little casas de santo, uh, little, little, uh, uh, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Cuban health groups. Uh, uh, I spent the last year on a fellowship uh, at the Swedish um, uh, Collegium for Advanced Studies, and lo and behold, towards the end of my stay, I discovered that there is a there's a group of uh, practitioners of Afro-Cuban religion right there in Uppsala. You know, most of them Swedes, of course, you know, <laughs> as one would suspect. You know, so, uh, and uh, so, you know, some people have argued, have gone around and said that, you know, I, yeah, I never really understand how, you know, so people can uh, come up with these numbers. You know, so, so people go always write, oh, there are so and so many thousands or millions of practitioners of Afro. Uh, of Santeria or Lukumi religion or whatever uh, you know, people are calling it these days, and uh, you know how they uh, can possibly count them is something that uh, is completely beyond me. I mean, you can certainly go around in Havana and see, you know, when you see somebody dressed all in white with you know lots of you know, ritual necklaces uh, around their, uh, uh, you know, around their. Uh, uh, you know, Nick, then uh, you, can, you can be pretty sure that it's a uh, recent initiative, uh, you know, not as uh, EIO. But, uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, then nowadays, you know, it wasn't you know, until 1991 nobody dared to wear his or her ritual necklaces in public. But, uh, but now you see them, and, you know, the intellectuals, you know, some, you know, some local politicians, you know, wear them. And, uh, and it's no longer, of course, incompatible with socialism, uh, which, you know, in itself, and it down. But, you know, I received those necklaces as well. Does that make me a, a Santero? Well, I, I think not. On the other hand, however, and that's you know, another thing that I'm looking at in the book, uh, when I started doing this research in the uh, mid-1980s, there were uh, five people uh, here in the United States doing similar things. And as it turned out, all of them, except me, are nowadays practicing Santeros. <laughs> so the, uh, you know, the, the, the constellation of you know, scholar and practitioner has really, in a sense, uh, begun to shift. And here's a, a you know, uh, but on the other side as well. This here is a book uh, written by uh, a friend of mine, uh, a ma man you know, who uh, calls himself on the label Oba Oriate Miguel Vili Ramos Ilari Oba which, uh, you know, it, it, these are his ritual titles. He's also, a, you know, an Oba Oriate, a Kauri Shell divine. <coughs> and, uh, but he's also a PhD candidate uh, in history at uh, Florida International University. So, uh, and, you know, the, <coughs> the book is kind of a, you know, sort of a, a, an interesting uh, generic hybrid because it's both kind of a divination manual and a uh, historiography of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, coconut divination, uh, coconut divination in this case, fully annotated with, uh, you know, footnotes, with archival work that went into it, uh, but also, uh, you know, oral history, and I suspect a little bit of divination as well. And that's, that wouldn't be surprising at all, because, uh, I mean, people have been divining the history of their practices for you know probably sixty to eighty years now, and uh, and you know that Supreme Court case too. I mean, um, as I learned, uh, you know, when I was um, you know watching this from afar, and you know, sort of occasionally uh, either telephoning or writing to Charles, it was in the days before the internet, of course. You know, I suddenly figured out that you know he had the whole court strategy, uh, you know planned out and was monitoring it, uh, you know, the, uh, as it was going on, through divination. So, I mean, you know, why not? Uh, Evans Pritchard, you know, when he was in, uh, you know, in 1930s, uh, 20s, uh, Sunderland, uh, of course, as you may know, famously uh, wrote that, uh, you know, organizing his life in accordance with the Poison Oracle uh, was, you know, worked perfectly fine. I mean, you know, so he probably couldn't have done it when he went back to, to Oxford, uh, you know, the killing uh, killing the chickens or poisoning the chickens would have been a little problematic there, but uh, just to say the very least. But, uh, but I mean, this is kind of like a coherent world that is informed by a type of rationality that, uh, you know, may not jive with ours, but delivers its uh, results, for example, in the forms of books uh, just as well. Now, I, I should probably, you know, I really haven't uh, talked 
at all about what um, you know what I also you know what I wrote this book for maybe uh, to uh, make a statement uh, and I can elaborate on that in, uh, in the question period because I'm already I see I'm talking quite a quite a bit but, all right okay but then you know I'll, I'll give it another five to uh, ten minutes and. Um, and tell you that um, one of the things that I want to uh, argue uh, in this particular project is that um, something that we can call Afro-Cuban religion, whatever it's, you know, it's the, the problems with these predications are, as well as with the term religion itself, which uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, as in many parts of the world, you know, practitioners of Afro-Cuban religion or what we retrospectively think we can identify as such, really only belatedly began to understand that what they were doing was practicing a religion when they came into contact with uh, you know, regulatory or persecutory uh, state uh, agents. And this is actually exactly what happened, because by the, uh, by 1902, of course, you know the uh, ratification of the Cuban Constitution and the American auspices had included freedom of religion, which uh, religious practice, as long as it uh, as long as it didn't go against Christian morality. <laughs> so, uh, by the, you know, in, in the midst of a uh, really a horrendous uh, anti. African witchcraft campaign driven by uh, a number of self-appointed uh, scientific modernizers uh, who were sort of at that point you know, highly infected with Lombrosian criminal anthropology. Uh, in the midst of you know, campaigns against you know, African witchcraft in Cuba, which were deadly as a matter of fact. I mean, you know, lots of people wound up garroted or you know, otherwise you know, sort of, uh, killed. In the midst of that, uh, you know, one of uh, you know a couple of, of practitioners decide to uh, confront the, the issue head on and um, write themselves into the Cuban state apparatus as uh, as an an African Christian Lukumi morality, and you know they acquired you know the legal reg registration as you know as a, as a voluntary association and so on and so forth. And it really sort of began to mushroom out from there. I think they didn't really understand at that point that uh, you know sort of they were on the way to becoming a religion. But by the 1930s, 40s, they had understood that they could actually really inscribe themselves into uh, the state, you know, the legal apparatus of the state as such, and enjoy a certain amount of protection from a state that was otherwise persecuting them. What also falls into this period is a kind of an interesting volt fuss uh, on the part of one of those uh, scientific modernizers, uh, the great uh, Fernando Ortiz, the you know, towering intellectual Cuban, possibly Caribbean, and maybe even Latin American uh, intellectual giant of the 20th century, who uh, in probably the late teens or early 20s uh, made, had a kind of a weird conversion experience and was suddenly a uh, no longer arguing that these things needed to be studied in order to be better eradicated, but was actually arguing that this is our heritage. And that uh, Cuba was uh, uh, a, um, as he you know, put it in a wonderful metaphor from which uh, you know, the title of my book derives, was a kind of a stew with different ingredients bubbling away on the, on the hearth of history, so to speak. Uh, and uh, what he was arguing is that um, you know different kinds of ingredients in this kind of stew, uh, you know, are still visibly uh, demarcated as when you look on the surface. But as you know the cooking time increases, they sort of meld and blend into each other until you know sort of you get something that is like a sauce on the bottom. And this was his vision for uh, kind of a hybrid national cultural and in a sense racial project, which, you know, of course, you know, greatly inspired, uh, you know, the, uh, the revolutionary project of 1959, but, uh, 
but uh, this is very old by then. But, uh, but anyway, uh, well, these, by the 1920s, actually even before, you know, I found some uh, stuff in his archive that indicates that he had been involved with practitioners of Afro-Cuban religion since about 1909 and had uh, actually given them some legal advice about you know, how to get permission, for example, to use African drums in public and things like that. But, but by the 1920s, he had actually uh, amassed a uh, uh, you know, sizable uh, you know, Africanist literature, and he actually made that available to his informants. So starting a kind of a, a feedback process, which you know, continued all through the 20th century, whereby uh, you know, um, uh, practitioners uh, read Africanist literature or read ethnographies about their predecessors, Feed, you know, uh, well, I should say not uncritically. I mean, uh, they oftentimes, you know, will be the first to point out errors or you know, mistaken descriptions of things. But, but they kind of, you know, also absorb stuff, partly also by using divination or by uh, or or spiritist, uh, you know, means in, in order to incorporate some of these things into their own practices. And uh, so. What begins to form at that point is what I call an ethnographic interface, where you know, and the interface is like a you know um, a membrane. You know, things pass back and forth across it, and uh, and sort of there's you know forms of inscription emerging on the ethnographic side that feed back into the practices that get inscribed subsequently, and all of this is kind of including, of course, the, pra the participants in this kind of, you know, sort of unequal to be sure, but uh, certainly dialogic uh, pattern, uh, including the, you know, the participants, are being, in a sense, cooked by history, so to speak. And what emerges is a constantly uh, changing uh, ethnographic object, you know, so that that is something where, you know, practitioners objectify their practices just as we objectify them. And these two uh, types of, you know, uh, I mean, there's an interactivity between these two forms uh, or camps of uh, forms of objectifying and uh, camps of objectifiers. So there's a kind of, you know, again, a, a sort of a circulatory pattern. And it becomes very interesting as you sort of look at this over, uh, over enough time when we take into consideration that some of, some people on my side of the ethnographic interface have sort of crossed over and have now become uh, objectifiers and practitioners of the, you know, of the matter, of, of this object we were, we, all of us are calling Afro-Cuban religion. And on the other hand, you know, there, there's uh, you know, people like we Ramos, who's uh, now uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, academically certified uh, historian of his own tradition. And, uh, which he continues to practice, and which you know, also informs his scholarship in ways that I find utterly fascinating. Because I mean, one chapter which I um, in, in the book which I have called um, oh where are we uh, I called astronauts of the virtual Atlantic, uh, the giant African snail incident, the war <coughs> of Korea, case in the plague of Orishas. It, you know, it's actually based on an, uh, on a very <coughs> learned and, uh, in a sense, legally informed debate that uh, Ramos, uh, a couple of years ago, had on the web uh, with uh, a detractor uh, from uh, a faction of you know, the African traditionalists, so to speak, uh, or self-appointed African traditionalists who uh, resent certain practices that, the, you know, they think largely white Cubans uh, are engaging in and, and you know try to you know to reverse to what they think is a even more African uh, pattern. But so these you know, their project is galore on that kind of time, including Cuba itself, you know, sort of re Africanization movement and stuff like that. But, but anyway, so they have this conversation and you know, as it turns out, one of the bones of contention is that uh, Ramos has been laterally assimilating Orishas, that is, deities, uh, which he received in Brazil. Uh, and so he's been doing research in Brazil on Orishas that, you know, they and we think have been lost in Cuba, and he just brings them back, and they begin to proliferate. But it's not only that, you know, so that there's, you know what emerged on the web in particular uh, is a kind of a pattern whereby uh, entities 
divine or other, begin to multiply in potentially uncontrollable fashion. And this is something that you know some people, particularly in Miami, are very, very worried about. Uh, I mean, uh, when I was, um, I must have been sort of uh, six or eight years ago, and uh, you know, I remember you know, a moment when I, you know, I hadn't been in Cuba for about two years, and friends of mine you know, picked me up at the airport, and uh, you know, we chat a little bit about what's been going on, and they say, uh, oh, uh, you know, and have you heard about this you know, new entity, Yami Ochoronga? And I said, oh, what was that supposed to be? Uh, you know, it, it sounded kind of familiar in, in some ways, but I couldn't place it. They say, oh, it's you know this this kind of being that this balalao starts uh, you know multiplying. Uh, you know, it's like almost like a you know laboratory for deities. Uh, in uh, and it's the spirit of uh, evil doing. <coughs> and you know, so I, you know, I thought, well, that, that sounds really weird. But so and you know, and they were of the same opinion that, that you know that this is totally illegitimate. It's an invention, and you know, why should one have that to begin with? You know, why, you know, why the spirit of evil doing it? So, uh, you know, I thought, you know, where does that come from? And it hit me that it came from nowhere else but an article that Pierre Verger had written in the mid-1960s on the cult of, uh, and I, you know, I, I always am reticent of uh, pronouncing your names because I'm making hash of it, you know, Iami uh, Oshoronda or something like that, uh, which was uh, a cult, you know, still practiced in uh, in Yoruba land in the 1960s, uh, where um, which the aim of which was to appease the that's a euphemism, the mothers, which basically the witches. And so uh, you know, so somebody had read that and thought, hmm, that's an interesting thing. We should have that too. You know? <laughs> so uh, so there's you know, there's that and. Um, but anyway, I, I should, you know, I, I'm sure I can come up with you know, other examples, uh, you know, as we, uh, you know, as we engage in the you know, less one-sided conversation. And so I'm, you know, welcome. Any question? I should say that I need to split out here a couple of minutes before two because, uh, you know, we're interviewing. We'll, we'll be done. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're interviewing uh, staff uh, over at night. <coughs> while arguing amongst themselves correct ways of practicing it. 
you know, so you know, Havana is no no question. I mean, there is such an orthodoxy, and in Miami too, New York, I imagine just as well. But as you move away from that, you know, things get a little different. Uh, you know, here, for example, uh, you know, Afro Cuban stuff uh, merges quite. You just have to go to one, some of the botanicas merges with Mexican, uh, you know, folk practices, and you know, that's you know something that you know people. I don't know if they care about, but uh, but it's you know we, we're the boondocks from the perspective of uh, you know the, the African primary or secondary diasporas. So here, sure, I mean you know if you, if, you know if you want it, uh, you can mess around. Uh, you can sort of uh, enhance. I mean on the web, so you know the, so the kind of virtual diaspora is I think uh, a wonderful. Uh, site for uh, exploring these kinds of merges with new age sensibilities. But, you know, I remember, you know, I, was, um, I lived in Washington, D.C. Uh, for some six years in the uh, 1990s to early 2000s, and uh, one of the people, you know, I was talking about when I mentioned that, you know, uh, four out of five people who started studying this stuff in the uh, in the 1980s are now priests of, you know, an African religion. One of those people, a man named Michael Mason, who's a curator at the Smithsonian, um, also happens to be a practicing priest, and he had a little, uh, you know, uh, Casa de Santo, uh, consisting largely of um, white <coughs> American, uh, and, you know, lots of them were women. So it's a, you know, kind of a, and many of them uh, came from a new age uh, background. Some of them lived in Tacoma Park, which is sort of the, uh, you know, the epicenter of you know, uh, new ages in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And you know, I remember being invited uh, to a uh, Lukumi marriage ceremony that uh, our mutual friend, Ernesto Pichardo, had just invented a few years earlier. Uh, and uh, which didn't involve any animal sacrifice you know, so the, the pigeons were just let loose into the air and were you know, all very civilized but, uh, but anyway sort of, it was really interesting to sort of observe you know, these you know, American uh, adherence devotees don't know what, what to call them talk about the various problems that they perceive animal sacrifice being really big you know, the, that's this very, very hard to stomach for most new ages. Unless, you know, maybe if they came from a Wiccan, uh, you know, a background, it would, might, might be a different story, but, you know, I, I, I don't know enough about it. But, and, and there are, by the way, there are merges on, online, you can see merges between uh, Wiccan sensibilities and afro cuban religions. I mean, uh, uh, very interesting, all of that. But, uh, but uh, you know, so the animal sacrifice was a real big thing, uh, concession. Lots of people just, you know, how in the world would I ever get possessed? You know, and what would happen if I did? You know, and, uh, you know, may, some of them may have tried, actually, but it didn't work. So, uh, that, that, you know, that's another issue. But, so there are, you know, there are these things occurring here, but interestingly, what's happening in Havana, and that's been happening for a long time, you know, and in the other parts of the, of the Caribbean, is of course the spread of Western esotericism, or now also Eastern esotericism, which gets layered onto things. You know, so that, for example, a uh, good friend of mine, a uh, really interesting story. Uh, you know, didn't make it into the book, but uh, you know, I need to write that up sometime uh, at, at, some, you know, at a later stage. A uh, good friend of mine, uh, who was uh, actually the first. Um, Cuban sent to the Soviet Union to study anthropology. He got a master's from the University of Leningrad, uh, and was then sent on all kinds of, you know, sort of really horrible, uh, you know, sort of uh, missions in Angola and in eastern Cuba, where you know, sort of villages were to be flooded, you know, or hydroelectric dams, and sort of kind of, you know, state-sponsored uh, ethnographic projects, which uh, to this day are classified. I mean, he has, you know, he has to surrender everything he had about that. But, but anyway, so he comes back, you know, this, this, uh, he has a bit of a career in the, um, uh, you know, Cuban Academy of Sciences, and then somehow falls out of political favor, gets fired from uh, all of his positions, and basically retreats to his native town of Regla, where um, he eventually um, befriends a 
very old and uh, impressive uh, man, a uh, neighbor of his who's uh, a practitioner of the Afro Cuban religion, and eventually gets, you know, my friend gets initiated too. So, uh, um, and um, he uh, has a large family. Uh, there's like six siblings. Uh, one of them, uh, he's a son Pedro. One of the siblings is uh, a um, Reiki master. So uh, another one uh, is a lawyer. Uh, you know, I, I mean, they cover all the, all the bases. I mean, you know, there's, they do other kinds of, you know, but each one of them does a different kind of, uh, you know, sort of practice, ranging from law to you know Western esoteric traditions, or you know, in that case, Reiki, which is apparently spreading like crazy. In the, uh, in Havana these days, but uh, there are long traditions of consulting, you know, things like, you know, Egyptian Book of the Dead, you know, just seeing, dabbling in these things to see whether there are correspondences. I mean, you know, uh, the idea of, the, of an Egyptian origin of Yoruba culture is old and has been spread around by the Brits, actually, uh, during colonial times. And uh, reached uh, you know sort of uh, theological flourishes in the 1940s, uh, you know, and, and, and onward actually were you know the attempts usually sort of uh, along philological lines have been made to trace you know whatever they were over to Egypt. So it's not surprising that you know since people learned in Cuba by the 1930s that they were practicing a Yoruba derived religion because you know the Yoruba as such didn't really exist by the time that the slaves left Cuba. And the Yoruba ident identity is really a Christian missionary project that commences in about the 1890s, and really only consolidates by about the 1920s. And so, uh, so, so there's an ethnogenetic process going on there as well. But uh, you know, in, and in the course of that, you know, sort of these, you know, Egyptophilia plays a certain role. So you know, why not? Uh, you know, sort of once you know that, you know. You're practicing something that comes out of Yoruba land, and that in turn comes out of uh, out of Egypt. You know why not sort of assimilate towards that literature as well? So you know that's been that's been going on for a long time as well. And you know one of the things you know uh, if you talk about the anglophone Caribbean, I mean, for a long time, the center, if one wants to put it that way, of a kind of occult Afro-Caribbean uh, world was 828 South Wabash Avenue, because that was the seat of the DeLawrence Company, which uh, mail order, you know, sent, you know, occult literature, I mean, DeLawrence himself produced, you know, a fabulous array of crazy stuff, uh, you know, with, uh, <laughs> Hindu magic and, you know, whatnot, the sixth and seventh book of Moses, you know, they they sold that, you know, by the, by the thousands, uh, the, Petit and Grand Albert, you know, the, all of these grimoires, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And they sold it all across the Anglophone colonial world. Uh, it, you know, the, the, a friend of mine uh, always comes up with the, you know, the greatest uh, the research uh, strategies um, uh, presented, I think it was at the uh, American Academy of Religion meetings here in Chicago a few years ago, presented a paper uh, on research that he had done online uh, in uh, philatelic sites, where people actually have a category, and I don't know, it's called imprint or whatever, uh, of letters, uh, stamped letters, that uh, were addressed to the DeLawrence Company and are being sold at relatively high prices. And by looking at where these letters came from, you suddenly got this kind of geography of a, of a DeLawrence empire. Which reached, uh, you know, sort of uh, all across the uh, the Anglophone Caribbean, where all of these books were prohibited, uh, and actually, a possession uh, could of these books could land you uh, in jail or at least in front of the magistrate for practicing obia. But it also, the Lawrence also reached into Africa. There are, uh, you know, there are letters mailed from the Belgian Congo. And all the way across to uh, to the Pacific, uh, like uh, Mauritius and uh, Rio Leone. So, uh, so there are these, you know, sort of points of connection which you know people have not really paid enough attention to because these are really kind of you know these, and you know that that's perhaps where I should say something about the misgivings in terms of religion here. Uh, the view of religions as uh, kind of discrete, enumerable 
entities is really, let's face it, a product of the breakup of, you know, uh, Catholic Christendom uh, in the course of the Reformation, and, and you know, then the kind of um, you know religious, uh, largely secularist religious uh, history scholarship that comes out of the Enlightenment and, uh, and the 19th century. So uh, the idea that, uh, for example, there are uh, you know religions, and then there are syncretic mixtures of them is totally alien to, uh, I think, a lot of people who uh, practice this, that, or the other thing. And it's really an artifact of, you know, scholarly and, you know, some, of course, also on the part of, you know, religious orthodoxies, uh, endeavors to police boundaries around what, you know, you want to define as a religion. So, in, I mean, uh, you know, um, there, there's an essay in here which I use, uh, uh, you know, revised, a chapter in here which is revised, version of an essay that I published uh, in 1993 uh, where, uh, you know, I basically say that, you know, syncretism is really an artifact that, uh, you know, we have brought into the world, but that, in a sense, we have lost control over because, you know, some people actually uh, like to define themselves as syncretic in the sense of being ecumenical. You know, so that, you know, we're open to our everything. So that's, you know, that's fine, you know, which is also in part a kind of a new age, uh, you know, at least some versions of new age have that kind of, you know, omnivorous quality. I think we're really just out of time. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs>listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.